Hello and welcome to another Arizona Hip Historian Virtual Happy Hour Tour. I am Brenda Holt with AARP Arizona. We are the nation's largest nonprofit, nonpartisan organization that is dedicated to empowering people 50 and older to choose how they live as they age. And with a nationwide presence of nearly 38 million members across the nation, and over 900,000 right here in Arizona, we work to strengthen communities and we advocate for what matters most to families, such as health security, financial stability, and personal fulfillment, to name a few. During the months of May and June, we will focus on healthy living and amplify the call to action for the 50-plus community to develop healthy habits for mental well-being. As the country continues to grapple with the ebbs and flows of the COVID-19 pandemic, many are eager to move into a sense of normalcy. Many in the 50-plus community have developed coping mechanisms that show a strong sense of resiliency and the need to anchor themselves. Ongoing public health concerns, economic issues, and global conflicts are still weighing on older adults. By covering topics like sleep, stress management, healthy eating, and exercise, AARP demonstrates that its healthy living offerings can help Americans develop and maintain healthy habits for their mental well-being. Visit us for resources and information at www.aarp.org backslash mental health or at www.aarp.org backslash Arizona. Thank you for attending tonight's session. Have a good evening. Well, good evening, and I want to welcome you all to Arizona History Happy Hour. Good evening, and happy May 26th. I want to welcome you all as we get ready for a really fun show. Now, my name is Marshall Shore, and I am your host on May 26th. And, you know, we always like to talk a little bit about, well, you know, what kind of what's going on? So back in 1930... President Hubert Hoover signed a proclamation creating Sunset Crater National Monument right here in Arizona. It is also World Dracula Day because back in nine, um, eight, nine, um, back in 1887, the Gothic horror novel was produced by Bram Stoker. And so that launched a whole set of stories, movies, writing careers, and so much all about Dracula. It is also National Lindy Hop Day, which is also known as the Jitterbug, which is very much an American dance that first came about in the 20s and popularized by the big band movement. Today is also Airplane Day. Those paper airplanes that we all used to make as kids. Well, you know, there are competitions all over the country today measuring how far your plane can go, how long it'll stay up in the air. And I think it's kind of fun that people are still playing around with those paper airplanes. Now, it is also National Cherry Dessert Day. All those beautiful cherries that can go from white to red and so many, I mean, that really deep cherry red. Oh my gosh. Um, so many uses from savory to sweet, you know, and here is your chance to go make something. But, you know, I would suggest you wait till after the show to do that. Um, it is also Sally Ride Day. She was born 
on May 26th. And so this celebrates her many achievements of the late American astronaut and astrophysicist and first American woman in space, Dr. Sally Ride. So what can you expect on tonight's show? Well, we do a little bit of Arizona history. We've got a little small town history, as well as some Arizona music. We've got some trivia. There's a beverage. There's a guest. And then we also have From the Vault, which is something that you might drive by that could be in plain sight. You might not even realize is there. So if this is your first time watching, you might wonder, who is that man and why is he on my screen? Well, as I said, my name is Marshall Shore. I'm also known as the hip historian. And so basically, I came to Arizona a little over 22 years ago from Brooklyn. I was working in a beautiful Carnegie building and decided to trade that winter weather for some place that had lots of sunshine. And that was a little library in South Central Phoenix and promptly moved into a beautiful 1956 ranch. And, you know, there's my kitchen still looks like today, just like it did back in 1956. Now, as soon as I got here, all I kept hearing about how there was no history, but I knew that wasn't true because every time I went somewhere, I would come face to face with so many amazing people, places, and stories. Then there's that post-war boom. All those GIs either were stationed here, trained here, or after the war, they were moving here in huge numbers, looking for a new way of life. And that is indeed what they found. So I'm also called the hip historian, which means I get to play a lot with Arizona history. So why in just a couple of weeks, I am part of Burnerella, which is a Bisbee Arts takeover by a group of burners. So that's going to be a lot of fun and an amazing little town. Um, also, I did an Ignite a few weeks ago. And so actually, that's how we're going to end the show is I'm going to show the presentation that's just under five minutes all about LGBTQ history right here in Arizona. As well as coming up um, through the next couple months, I am a part of summer reading with various libraries across the county. And so we are going to be doing some Disney history in Arizona, as well as LGBTQ history in Arizona. So check out your local library and see what's going on there. Um, some of them are virtual, some of, their, some of them are in person. So there's a wide mix of things. So, and always remember, I see some of you have found the chat. I mean, Sherry's already mentioned about how she loves Jello cups with cherries in them. And, you know, if you don't find something in the chat or if you forget to put something in the chat, you can always reach out to me on Facebook, Instagram, email, or even via my website. So, well, you know, it would not be a happy hour without a bit of a beverage. And, you know, I am lucky enough to have PJ, my cocktail advisor, who every week for pretty much two years has been making a cocktail that goes along with the theme. And so tonight we are, I am having a Nungroni. And so it's a little bit of inclusive gin a little bit of gin, ginger lemon aperitivo and some vermouth. So a classic Negroni recipe, but lots of inclusion. Mm, yeah, that's a good one, PJ. Thank you so much. All right. Oh, and we also, when he was taking this photo, his cat Oliver decided to jump in and do a little photo bomb. So everyone said, hello, Oliver. I don't think the cat was getting into the drink, but I don't know. All right. So now we get to talk about a little Arizona town. Today, we're going to talk about the town of Safford, which is in Graham County, has just a little over 10,000 people, was established back in 1881. And so it was really kind of founded when some folks moved from up north looking for a different way of life and was named for a territorial governor. 
Now, in Safford, you'll find a variety of things, including the Salsa Trail. So I think the end of September is they'll be doing another kind of festival. It's a series of restaurants that are all mom and pop places that all make their own salsa. And so you can have some of the best salsa in Arizona, right? And one after the next. Um, also, there is the Gila Box Riparian National Conservation Area. What I love about this is it really, it's the Gila River cutting right through a canyon, through desert highlands. And the river is big enough at points you can even take floating trips are possible. You can camp out there. You can do all kinds of things. And kind of this area really celebrates the unique geology, the history, and wildlife of the area. You can also go visit the Roper Lake State Park which you can rent out for a variety of events. And it started off originally as a private recreation area. And the 60s was then taken over by and became the Roper State Park. Um, they used to have hot springs. Sadly, those hot springs have closed and they haven't talked about opening them yet. So, but, you know, you can still go visit Essence of Tranquility, where they have six different tubs for a variety of soaking experiences. You can stay there. You can soak there. You can get a massage, all kinds of kind of healing or self-care things right there. Now, one of the things you can also do is you can visit the Eastern Arizona College Discovery Park campus, which really celebrates the agricultural history, the mining history, as well as space exploration history. And so you, you can go tour and actually, I think it's getting ready to open up again um, through August for tours. So I'm definitely going to try and get down there. I think one of the cool things is they have a variety of telescopes and one of them is sponsored by Vatican City. And I thought that was kind of a little bit of a fun, kind of a nod to kind of what's coming. Our special guest. Oh, my gosh. You're going to have so much fun with Sister Jareth. Let's bring Sister Jareth on the screen. Hello. Hi, y'all. How's it going? Oh, my gosh. Thank you so much for being here. Yeah, thank you for having me. I also have my cocktail, which probably, well, mine is, you know, a pre-mixed. It probably also has cat hair in it, though, too, so. One same page here. <laughs> well, at least we're probably having at least some of the same ingredients. There right. you go. You know, a little cat dander in your cocktail just makes it better. Love it. Yeah. So, Sister Jareth, tell us a little bit about yourself. Oh, and you know, one thing I should also say is, so when PJ was making this cocktail, he was workshopping with a handful of other bartenders. And he had to explain why the name, the Nun Grony. And oh. they all were like, oh. We've never heard of this group. So they were all immediately on their phones Googling and they're like, oh my gosh, that is so cool. That is awesome. Well, hopefully we'll have like a little pocket of just a, a few more fans out there. Exactly. Uh, That's exactly the goal. Yeah. Yeah. Well, about myself, um, I'm, I'm one of the Sisters of Perpetual Indulgence. I'm with the Grand Canyon chapter, which is here in Arizona. And uh, I... I want to say I started my sister journey probably in 2009 when I first met the sisters at Folsom Street Fair. Um, it was a great time. I used to live in San Francisco and I realized it was Sister Roma and she was just kind of um, covered in feathers and walking around as she does. I think she was leading a couple of adult leather puppies on some chains and I was just, I, wa I want to know what that is. Uh, and then kind of fast forward to I want to say maybe 2014 is when I really got to know the sisters in other places other than San Francisco. I didn't know this was a thing. I just thought they're just oh. in that city, you know, and, and that's cool. And I thought it was only for gay men. And I was like, I, that's fantastic. I, I will watch from afar. And uh, coming into uh, DragCon in 2014, I saw the LA sisters there and I got to speaking with some of them and I realized some of them were born female and some of them didn't identify as gay males. And I was like, this is interesting. Let me, let me talk more with them and see if there's somebody in the Phoenix metro area. And lo and behold, we had a house here already. Uh, and so I decided a couple years later, I was ready to join a kind of you know, uh, figured out my schedule, rearranged things and um, started to join the process in 2017. So I've been with them 
uh, for five years now, just kind of following at first and you go through the process and then actually becoming a fully professed, what we call fully professed ministrant. And it's been a really great journey. Indeed. So if people don't know about the scissors, that's kind of what you're going to be doing. We're going to be doing some trivia that kind of help explains who the sisters are and kind of their history and place in history, as well as right here in Arizona. Exactly. So now we're doing trivia a little bit differently because kind of all these questions build on one another. We're actually going to go through them all at once. And so we'll go through kind of talk about the question and then go through the answer. So it's a little different than we normally do, but you know, I still expect you all to keep score because you know, at the very end, we're going to ask, how did you do? And that's always the fun part to see how well people either guessed or what they actually knew. But you know, at the end of it, we all are going to have a great time. Yes, yes. Indeed. All right. So our first question, and people keep track of, you can keep track of your information. You can either do your answers either in the chat session. You can do it on a catch up with some ketchup and a hot dog, whatever you would like, you know, we no judgment here on how you want to keep score. All right. So our first question is which of these movements or groups came first? Was it A, the Radical Fairies, B, the Mattachine Society, C, the Sears of Perpetual Indulgence, or D, the Sugar Plum Fairies? Now, make sure you write your, your answer down for that because we're going to go on and talk a little bit about it. So which of these movement groups came first? Yeah, so coming first was actually the Mattachine Society. It was actually, it, they went through a few iterations of names. Um, one of the names was uh, the um, the Fools group or the group of fools, um, simply because Mattachine Society is coming from kind of like medieval French play on uh, some satirical mockery where kind of effeminate men were wearing masks and they would go out and they would be brandishing swords and just kind of make fun of their society. And because they were anonymous and because of the fact that uh, they weren't really, they weren't really known, they were able to kind of criticize without having any kind of consequences society. And so that's really what the Mattachine Society was about as well, but in the 1950s. So in 1950s LA, uh, there was a, a group of men uh, that had kind of been talking a couple of years prior uh, and they determined that they really wanted gay rights and they really wanted to challenge what society was doing at that time, especially in such a large city like LA. And we see other things. Uh, I think probably the only other group or organization that may have come first was um, a civil rights group in Chicago. But this was one of the first foundational cities um, and groups for LGBT rights. Um, and what we see is that they tend to do what Martin Luther King Jr. did in that they did a lot of uh, civil disobedience and sit-ins and silent protests, peaceful protests. And um, one of the campaigns that they had was called the SIP-IN. And I believe, hopefully we have a picture of that, um, but the SIP-IN movement was essentially when we had um, these gay men who identified outwardly as gay, there we go, um, and they would go to various bars. So the, the Mattachine Society kind of splintered into groups in Chicago and New York and San Francisco. And um, at Julius's bar in the Greenwich Village in New York in 1966, there's this very famous photo that was actually definitely staged. Uh, they had a photographer there ready to take a picture of this very historical moment of when a bartender was refusing to serve alcohol to gay men, outwardly gay men. And, and the reason was they said that gay men were disorderly by nature. Uh, just they're, they're not, uh, they're unruly and they don't have the ability to be civil human uh, people in society. And so uh, you can see there, there are actually four members there. And uh, Randy Wicker's the one on the right. Um, and it, this photo on him on the right side as well. In um, 2019, he kind of was recanting um, through uh, various publications at the age of 81, what this meant to him and how it meant uh, such a revolutionary, it was such a revolutionary moment in the 50s and 60s, uh, the sip in kind of campaign before we even get to Stonewall. So it was very interesting that uh, these came up. 
and they refer to them often as uh, the lavender scare. So the the heteronormative people, the lavender scare, right? Which is it's a what we would call like a parallel to the red scare, right? Uh, like this communism idea is very scary, and then also this this queer or gay man society uh, being also very scary, and people making lists and accusing other people, kind of like a witch hunt. Witch hunt. Uh, and so this is just a way to give back to their community by being outwardly, orderly gay men. Uh, I thought that was really great. Um, and then uh, we have a few other groups in there as well. I just wanted to mention all of them because they all kind of interconnect. Um, so the Mattachine Society was started by Harry Hay Jr., Arthur Evans, uh, Mitch Walker, and Don Kilfneffer, I believe is how you say his last name. And um, the Sugar Plum Fairies actually had a little bit of an overlap as well. Um, and so the Sugar Plum Fairies started in uh, the mid late seventies. Um, as you can see, there are two articles that I found here from uh, one is from the Des Moines Register and one is from the Daily Iowan, uh, both local papers at the time for this. Uh, and uh, Ken Bunch and uh, Tracy Bjorgum hope I say that correctly. Uh, they were both partners and founders of the Sugar Plum Fairies, which was kind of like a theatrical troupe that out of sexual revolution and the, uh, the idea of um, exploring sexuality, what it meant to be a gay man, outwardly gay man, uh, created this group to express that through different artistic venues, either stage plays, uh, uh, recreating well-known scripture and, and making it, you know, kind of queer centric. Um, and these two men also were uh, the first couple in Iowa to try to apply for a marriage license. So they do also interconnect with uh, gay marriage in that piece. And um, they were rejected. And that's why they got uh, those two articles there in the newspaper. Flipping my page because I got lots of notes. And they're just reminders. Um, and then the radical theories uh, actually came in, I want to say like the uh, early 1979, late 1978. Um, what they did was they kind of played on the same idea of uh, group drag troupe theater. Um, and they were, but they were a little bit more spiritual based. If you could see here, um, you know, the spiritual conference, which was held in September of 1979. This is an actual um, leaflet for it. There's the front and the back. And uh, they actually, fun fact, came to um, uh, near Tucson in Benson, Arizona. And it was this uh, place where people could just kind of be out in nature do a lot of LSD and explore each other's sexual bodies. They had programming for one day. And then after that day, they're like, well, what do we do? So they did mud wrestling and they they were naked and they explored each other's bodies and they had sex with as many people as possible. And this is all, of course, kind of on the precipice of HIV and AIDS um, coming out as a, as a issue for um, gay, gay men. Um, so you can see there, they have what they called a call to gay brothers. Um, and so this language is important because the Sisters of Perpetual Indulgence also start to use the words, the calling and spirituality and religion. And we start to um, kind of take some of those pieces um, that are related to the radical theories. Um, but we also kind of turned as you can see, to a slightly different shtick. Um, so you can see here, um, there are two photos from uh, the first conference, the first spiritual conference, uh, where people are just obviously having a good time out in nature. Um, and there are little butterfly emojis because almost everybody was naked for most of the time. <laughs> True. All right. So where did the sister, sistery, all began was it a iowa city iowa b san francisco california c kansas city missouri or d benson arizona iowa city iowa city yeah so i kind of I hinted toward it earlier i did mention benson of course um but iowa city iowa um this is where ken bunch was from who was one of the founding sisters and kind of after the marriage license debacle and starting the radical uh sugar plum or sorry rather the sugar plum fairies uh the sugar plum fairies were actually a traveling drag troupe and they traveled all around iowa trying to do different kinds of drag shows and what ended up happening was they knew somebody um, in their group named Susan, 
it's always a Susan. And um, she decided that she was um, friends with a, a, a mother reverend at a local Catholic convent. And she was like, hey, I know that when nuns pass away, they retire their habits, their uniforms, and they kind of just store them. And we could tell these nuns uh, that we would like to borrow their outfits for a rendition of The Sound of Music, which of course, you know, was classic and popular. And uh, they did get the five habits, um, but they did lie about what they were using them for. They in <laughs> fact used them for drag shows and um, doing different kinds of drag shows that made fun of and um, kind of satirized Catholicism. And they even did um, a University of Iowa cheer, which the University of Iowa cheer, if you're familiar with it, um, it just like most university cheers, it's like fight, fight, fight um, until the game has won are the lyrics. And really it was uh, kind of an allusion to we're in the gay liberation front times and we need to fight for our rights. And at this time there were other things going on even and especially when you're trying to look like or, or be a man wearing a nun's uniform um, or habit. And so um, this was super important at the time. So that happened, um, Iowa City, they got the habits like in the mid late seventies and then uh, Kenneth Bunch decided to take some of them with him to Castro when he moved in the late seventies. All right, what were the originally protesting challenging in san francisco was it a communism b the pope c the castro clone or d makeup store owners and the reveal is so jareth i think you might need to explain a little bit maybe what is a castro clone yeah, I think uh, a lot of our viewers may not know exactly what that is. Um, as I mentioned, Kenneth Bunch moved to the Castro, which was and still kind of is considered the gay Disneyland of the world, uh, a small section in San Francisco that was known to be inclusive for gay men. However, there was kind of this caveat that you wanted to move there. You wanted to be a part of the Castro culture. You had to be a Castro clone. And so a Castro clone uh, was a way that not only Castro or San Francisco, but other cities, uh, including New York, including LA, started to recognize and kind of categorize gay men. And that's because in the 50s, 60s, 70s, it was not okay for gay men to be any kind of effeminate uh, figure. So no drag, no makeup, um, couldn't even just wear, like you could wear, you know, your entire outfit, but you couldn't wear heels. So anything that was feminine, feminizing, um, or was considered like female in any kind of way, including impersonating females, uh, was not allowed. And so what we see is instead, very obviously gay men, even super effeminate men, would instead kind of go the other way and become super masculine. Um, and when they became super masculine, as you can see here um, with the yellow cab hat um, and then the adult film stars, they're kind of looking like, I don't know, lumberjacks. Um, it became like, you had to take on this role of very machismo, very masculine. Um, you know, that's why we have the, um, this visual when we talk about the village people there's a construction worker there's a biker there's a, you know these are very masculine kind of roles and even if you are within your own culture like the native american uh person played in the the village people it's still a very masculine role it's the chief right and so muscles um being lean um being healthy short hair all of those things that are very masculine uh, kind of called um or related to the marlboro man at the time uh was what you wanted to be. And so going to San Francisco and wearing women's clothing, wearing actual nuns habits was something that they had to fight because it was not allowed uh, for gay men to wear anything like this very pu publicly and openly. And so when they did go out for the first time, they needed protection uh, because they were scared that they were going to be attacked even in their own community, even among other gay men for not quite fitting into that stereotype. Oops. All right. So in 1982, the sisters were the first queer organization to A, hold the first bingo fundraiser, B, exercise the Pope, 
C, have a member run for political office, or D, create and distribute a safe sex pamphlet. All right, and a drum roll, please. Oh my gosh, the first bingo fundraiser. Well, this is kind of a trick question because <laughs> our sisters did do all of these things, but not all of them were done in 1982. So we actually did the first bingo fundraiser um, in 1980 for the Cuban refugee program. If you uh, know about Cuban history, uh, Fidel Castro allowed for a boat to transport 125,000 Cuban refugees from Cuba to the United States through Miami. And some of them ended up in San Francisco. And so there was this movement and this program that was created by the government to support those Cuban refugees. So in 1980, they did hold a bingo fundraiser. You, of course, probably know bingo fundraisers as being a drag queen um, fundraising bar kind of uh, or, or just if, if not fundraising, fun event. Um, and it really started with the sisters then uh, back in 1980. And then um, in, uh, I believe, yeah, so in um, 1980, I'm sorry, I think it should say 83, 82, 83, um, but Sister Boom Boom did actually run for office in 1982 for the, um, the uh, San Francisco Board of uh, uh, Supervisors, I believe it was. Um, but he, so you run against multiple people and five are elected. He got a little over 23,000 votes uh, but there were a couple of consequences that came out of that. So he ended up being eighth. He didn't get elected to the board. Uh, but of course, right around this time, we have um, uh, Mama Jose and uh, and Harvey Milk also running. And so you see these other figures coming up. And this was an opportunity to kind of also make comical the idea of politics, while also the sisters were starting to gain some political momentum as well. And in this particular case, um, he ran, did not get the position and then uh, Diane Feinstein and a few other people that were in, in different various seats of uh, power in San Francisco decided to make a law called the Sister Boom Boom Law, which basically said that you cannot run under um, some sort of pseudonym. You have to have your actual legal name, which, of course, we've seen the hashtag my name is in more recent years because there are people that are trans or that are non-binary that have chosen names, but they don't have them legally listed on their birth certificate. And there was still was a big issue with all different kinds of platforms and social media using that. So uh, this really kind of sparked a lot of that and the, the conversation around that. And then he also ran as a mayoral candidate against Dianne Feinstein and lost, but um, had a good time kind of creating flyers against her, him flying on a on a broom um, and just kind of saying like surrender Diane and these kinds of things. So it was super fun to see uh, this kind of satirized campaign. And then there was also an exorcism of Pope John Paul II that happened from the sisters. Um, this is the only photo that I was able to find where you can see some visible sisters. They're kind of there in the front, um, like kind of down below where it says Popo go homo to the, to the right side there. Um, you can see a few people in kind of like a white face or a habit. And um, those sisters were there. There were six of them there to protest Pope John Paul II because as, at this point, HIV and AIDS had been identified. It was kind of spreading quickly. And the Pope said, I believe, I quote, um, God has love for the people afflicted or suffering of AIDS. And so, you know, like it's kind of like today's thoughts and prayers. It's not really going to do anything. And it was kind of a slap in the face to LGBT people trying to get fundraising and resources for HIV AIDS research and support. And so there was those those big protests of not just queer people, but also people that have family members affected by HIV and AIDS at that time. And so the sisters were there. Um, some of them got arrested or, or removed. Um, but the uh, the actual exorcism happened in Union Square. And it was a big demonstration, a big hubaloo um, there. If you don't know Union Square in San Francisco, it's this big kind of commercial area right in the middle of downtown. And it was uh, highly attended. And so, um, of course, we ended up getting uh, added to the papal list of heretics shortly thereafter. And then finally, the safe sex pamphlet, pamphlet did happen um, in 1982. We were the first organization to make a safe sex pamphlet with kind of the dawning of HIV and AIDS. And um, there are a couple of uh, different films that came out in regard to kind of that time uh, for San Francisco, uh, there was kind of a clash. Uh, 
we know them as bathhouses um, and bathhouses in the time, which is essentially where gay men relaxed, kind of like in a spa like setting, but also connected for sex or, um, you know, getting to um, have orgies, these kinds of things, um, a good old time. But unfortunately, um, HIV was spreading quickly in those in those uh, institutions. And so the bathhouses were approached and asked to please, you know, at least um, make sure that people are wearing condoms or, or trying to be safe. And uh, they said, we're making too much money. We're not going to shut down. So um, there's a movie uh, that came out in 2011 called um, We Were Here. And that is kind of like docu documentary style. And then there's also um, And the Band Played On, which is uh, 1993. Both of those films accurately portray what happened. Um, you're going to need tissues. Uh, it's just, it's really... Uh, straightforward history and very blunt. Um, and unfortunately, uh, we had to kind of satirize and make this pamphlet become available widespread because there were even people within our own community that were saying, we don't want to shut down. We don't want to stop people from having sex in a safe way. And so as you could see um, in that, uh, it's called pay, a play fair pamphlet. Um, there was uh, kind of like a little introduction with a sister on the toilet and she's like, I don't feel well, something's happening down there. And um, it kind of goes on from there, but it's basically, you know, get checked, make sure that you're being safe and uh, move forward with um, what you want to do. We're not trying to make you feel guilty or, or judge you for what you're doing sexually, but just be safe about it. And that was actually uh, the first safe sex, sex pamphlet ever created. And that was distributed by um, Sister Florence Nightmare, created and distributed by Sister Florence Nightmare, who you may know as Bobby Campbell, uh, who is the quote unquote uh, poster boy for AIDS, or they also called him the KS poster boy, because at that time it, it had gone through various iterations of names and different kinds of um, connected diseases or afflictions were um, kind of named that first. Um, he was actually... Um, put on Newsweek as somebody that had HIV um, going into AIDS in August of 1983. I believe he passed uh, in 1984 from AIDS complications, um, but he was the first kind of out loud proud saying, you know, I want to make sure people have safe sex. I want to make sure that I could, you know, make an impact while I'm still here. And then the other sister that kind of put out that pamphlet was Sister Ra's Erection. So play on names is always good. Indeed. All right. So question five, what year was the queer army campaign created? Was it a 1989, B 1990 or C 1992 or D 1995? And it is 1992. Correct. Yeah. So in 1992, we kind of saw a change. The sisters started to become a little bit more involved in politics and advocacy um, and um, specifically kind of created this poster that says, Sister Sam wants you. There's a picture of Uncle Sam there and a bunch of sisters in front um, and just saying, join the Queer Action Army today, Queer Army Hotline. And then here's a 415, you know, San Francisco area code phone number at that time. And the Queer Army really, uh, well, first of all, it was started by um, Sister uh, Bufadora and Sister Flatulana Grande, and both of them decided this is an important campaign to make uh, because it was founded in the idea that there's too much stigma and there's too much guilt and there's too much wrapped around in religion that makes LGBT people feel like they can't practice religion or they don't belong or they're going to hell or something like that. And since the sisters were kind of founded on Catholicism, you know, from the habits, but not really Catholic nuns, uh, they felt that this was a very special kind of intersection of identities to attack because at this time is when we started seeing more and more people um, attacking outwardly gay, especially gay males, um, in church. And um, actually, they decided to send out draft cards, um, which was really cute. Um, and then people signed up and gave their information. And then they were drafted into the gay army or the queer army. Um, and then they also distributed condoms on Valentine's Day at um, uh, University of San Francisco. And they were forcibly removed. Um, they had though a bunch of uh, protesters there with them to kind of say, again, you, you, know, you should be safe. Um, and then uh, there was a reverend, Reverend Cole, with the uh, Capital Christian Center, the CCC, and um, that uh, it, that was in Sacramento. And that organization was actively sending their members to the Castro 
to harass, uh, intimidate, and attack, violently attack or physically attack gay men that were out and walking around. And so um, they essentially, sisters essentially said, you know what, you're coming here to my location to attack me. So we're going to go to your location to peacefully protest and kind of, you know, like, quote unquote, um, attack you back or make a demonstration back. And so they went to the CCC and um, were just kind of outside and protesting and chanting um, during mass on Easter Sunday. Uh, we tend to do a lot of things on Easter Sunday. And uh, it so happened that some of them came out and one of them was a choir boy at the time. And he said, you know what, F this, I'm actually, I'm actually gay. And he joined the other side. And so that kind of shocked and amazed everybody that was there. Um, and he was uh, unfortunately... Um, disowned by his parents, but he ended up becoming sister lost and found uh, because he ended up being adopted by the sisters um, and kind of growing into their group a little bit, which is um, kind of a positive, although I do know that he did have some struggles later because he was still underage that um, they did take him into foster care afterward and all of that was a mess. But for a while anyway, he was able to kind of live his truth and that was one of the biggest things that the sisters had done, which is for just one person um, at a, at a non accepting uh, church situation. Now also there's the, the whole idea of just the global activism. Correct. Yeah. We got tons of global activism happening um, in these, in this, in the nineties, not only do we have sisters saying, well, we're going to try to stop the separation of church and hate but we're also, or start the separation of church and hate, but also we want, um, you know, in Sydney, for example, um, we want money and resources for HIV and AIDS uh, uh, activism, education, prevention. Uh, and then um, you end up seeing uh, sisters um, on the first slide that I had there, there was a sister uh, with um, a sign that said like US nuns uh, killed by US guns. And that's because unfortunately kind of bringing it back to the unfortunate thing that's happened in Texas, uh, there's a lot of gun violence that's happening. And that's actually an older photo. I believe it's from uh, the later 90s, uh, or actually, I'm sorry, younger, younger, a, a younger photo. So from the later 80s. Um, but you could see that there were some sisters already taking some political action um, for movements. We're not necessarily campaigning or supporting individual candidates, but we are saying we don't need gun violence. You know, we don't need um, church and hate. We need money for HIV research. And um, the Darwin sisters protesting also um, in Australia um, kind of had multiple signs going on there. Um, one of which is stopping AIDS. And then the other one was um, equality for people that have HIV and AIDS because people were being stigmatized. And this is really where we talk about um, promulgating universal joy and expiating stigmatic guilt. That's our mission statement. And we want to make sure that we don't have people feeling like they're isolated and left out and um, excluded. And so we started to see this happening all over the world with the other missionary houses or um, fully professed houses that we had at that time in the early 90s. All right, what year did the SPI, Sister of Perpetual Indulgence, have their first public blessing? Was it 1991? B, 1995, or C, 1999, or D, 2001. And 1995. It is 95. Yeah, so something the sisters are known for are giving blessings, because not only did we want to do this kind of like radical, sit-in, quiet, uh, peaceful protests back then, but we also wanted to partake in um, loud, out, extreme kinds of acts of uh, theater still, because that was where we came from. Those were our, our roots. And so the uh, San Francisco mime troupe actually were not quiet mimes. They were very loud mimes. And that was part of the name that was funny, um, the irony there, because they were um, also political uh, satirists in that they brought to light all of these things that were wrong with society in regard to human rights, women's rights, um, LGBT rights, going in depth to all of these kind of socio-political um, areas that people don't want to question. And uh, so the troop that's there on that slide, um, the uh, 1995 troop is, is pictured there. And then also there's a 1970, late 1970s, probably 78, 79 um, pamphlet um, for the political community theater workshop in quotes that kind of helped to start this movement, but they had been around and and done 
kind of funny or shtick theater um, even earlier, like in the 50s and 60s. But this was important. Uh, the blessing from the sisters was important for the troupe because they had been doing the same work the sisters had been doing the whole time. And they recognized that. And this is when we start to see sisters recognizing other organizations and supporting them for what they do as a part of the movement as well, because we're stronger together, of course. And so that's uh, one of those situations where we connected with an organization and supported them. All right, when did the Grand Canyon Sisters come onto the scene? Was it A, 2007, B, 2008, C, 2009, or D, 2010? And 2007. 2007. So we actually um, had reached out to San Francisco, which we lovingly called the Mother House at that time. And we said, hey, we're interested in joining. Uh, we want to kind of start a, a group here in the Phoenix metro area. We would love to do that. How do we do that? And so we started the process of what's called becoming a mission house. And uh, essentially we have to learn rules and follow those rules, learn how to do the makeup, learn how to wear the habit, um, learn how to talk to people in public. And we kind of, at that time, the members kind of supported each other in that because it was the first time people had really been asked to do it on their own. And the San Francisco house kind of like watched from afar, uh, visiting every once in a while, of course. And then in 2008 is when we actually had what's called the X Equator. And the X Equator is essentially um, the moment where the missionary house turns into a fully professed house. And this is kind of, again, a parallel of Catholicism where um, in, in, Catholic convents, nuns take vows. And so they have to take vows to become sacred soldiers for God. And so this is kind of the same idea of you're taking a vow for the rest of your life to be a nun. Um, and you're not quite exactly a Catholic nun, you're a queer nun, you're a, a nun of this queer army, but it is similar in that we try to parallel that and make sure that people realize that it is a calling. And that's, that's again, the wording that we started to use in the seventies, it's a calling because you feel moved to do this kind of work for the community. All right. What does our Arizona Quaff represent? A, the Grand Canyon, duh. B, the sporks given out at Taco Bell in the 90s. C, the traditional shape of a three-pronged swaro cactus, or D, the three major mountain ranges surrounding the Phoenix Valley. And just in case and, people didn't know, just in case people didn't know, the coif is kind of like this headpiece. So some people call it a coronet. Ah, uh, all right. And it is D, the three major mountain ranges surrounding the valley. Yeah. So we actually, it's technically four, but we count kind of two of them together. So on the west side of the valley, we have the White Tank Mountains. On the south side, we have both the Sierra Estrella and the South Mountains, um, which kind of almost run into each other. And then on the northeast side, we have the McDowell Mountains. And uh, because there are three major mountain ranges, we have three peaks on our on our cornet slash coif. Um, so you can see on the left, Sister Flora had the original coif. It was a little bit taller. Um, I was told it was made out of metal, aluminum, something like that, and could get very hot in the I summer. I was going to say, I'm like in the middle of summer. Oh my yeah. gosh. And singe some, singe, singe some foreheads. Uh, so they decided, you know, this is too, it's number one, it's bulky. It falls down easily, but also it's hot. So what can we do that's, uh, can keep its structure and kind of uh, still give us the same idea. And so you have a picture there of Sister Navi with the updated cloth um, from a couple of years ago. And of course I'm wearing it as well. Um, and so there's the three kind of points. We do also lovingly refer to, uh, refer to it as the spork. So the Taco Bell from the 90s spork is kind of, you know, the, <laughs> it just made me laugh because I was like, do you remember eating with sporks? They didn't have forks or spoons. They only had sporks. So, um, but we do call it the spork uh, sometimes. Um, and then also there's this hole in the top because this is all foam. And then we have a piece of uh, kind of thicker plastic on top. And then there's a hole in the middle. And so sometimes we also say like, we're the sisters of the big hole because Grand Canyon, the hole in our head, the head of the piece. Yeah, so it, it there's a lot of innuendo there, but um, that's why we call it uh, the spork or, or the hole, um, but it is for the mountain ranges. <laughs> <laughs> All right, so which sister started the white face? Was it A, Sister Missionary Position, Sister Vicious Power Hungry Bitch, C, Reverend Mother, or D, 
S Sister Hysterotica. And the answer is Sister Vicious Power Hungry Bitch. Yeah, so there's a lot of lore. And this is one of the stories that I love because everybody tells it different. It always comes up differently. Even Sister Vish, um, Vish for short, or Sister Vish New is her new name, but her name back then was Sister Vicious Power Hungry Bitch. Um, even she has some kind of contradictory stories. So you never know what you're going to get. Um, but there were two pieces in this, pe in this uh, period piece that she wrote. Uh, I believe it was in the 90s uh, that she wrote why the white face? And she gave a ton of explanation, but there were two major pieces. The first piece was she started dropping acid in the mid late seventies and putting on white face because the colors spoke to her more. When she put colors on top of white, they were more prominent. They photographed better. And she just kind of had more of a connection with the look and how it made her feel. And so she was like, yeah, I like this. I'm going to keep doing this. And so she was doing it as part of her drag troupe and then kind of took it into from the, the sugar plum fairies all the way into the sisters. The second piece that she mentions is that um, she was, you know, again, Castro clone. She was up and down in Castro. Um, and, you know, people were uh, cruising. They were trying to find gay men to have sex with. And if she was known as kind of a drag queen in a nun's habit, she would feel like she would be in danger, potentially in danger for having sex with men that then would see her and say, oh, well, you were that gay guy that was wearing that nun's habit. Like either I don't want to have sex with you or, you know, there might be a potentially dangerous situation there because it was still kind of um, taboo to be in women's clothing. So instead, what he did was he said, I, I wear the white face. People don't recognize me out of white face. Yes, I have the same voice. You know, I have the same walk, but like the get up, the, the costume kind of changes who I am and the white face kind of changes who I am. And so there was a level of anonymity for safety that he also said was there. What we like to say these days, um, because, you know, like anonymity, safety, you know, cruising in the Castro, like not all of those apply um, anymore. In some places they do. Uh, but um, we nowadays say that we wear the white face because we want to kind of be a reflection of the community. I don't want you to see me for who I am and my identities that are very easy to pick up on when I don't have something kind of coating my face. I'll put the spackle on so that you can kind of see this makeup and this design. And in somehow, you know, you are attracted to what I look like or, or how I'm manifesting. I'm manifesting energy that's within you already. And so we are reflecting you as a community. And, and um, Sister Mish, who is uh, one of the other sisters listed there, sister missionary position. She actually wears um, actual little, little or large uh, mirrors to say, I am a reflection of the community. Look, what do you see here? You know, you see yourself. And she gives those out to people and it's amazing. Um, but in kind of like the, in the, I want to say like the seven, 79 through 84 or so, um, a lot of sisters that saw sister Vish with the white face just said, mm, it's not for me because I don't want to, like, I'm already wearing a dress, basically, a nun's habit. I don't want to be putting on makeup because then that becomes even more feminizing. So they were looking at it from the other side of, this is too feminizing. I don't want to wear makeup because I'm more likely to be attacked. Um, and so that was their reasoning. So they, they stayed away from the white face until um, in 1984, the sisters uh, convent in San Francisco kind of dwindled because of HIV. They had lost a lot of members. A lot of members have passed away. So they only had about six members left. And for anonymity, for safety, and for uniformity, they said, let's all start wearing the white face. And they did. And so then from kind of 84 through the late 80s, you see there's a few sisters that aren't wearing it every once in a while. But for the most part, we start to see that. Unfortunately, or maybe fortunately, I don't know. There's a couple of places like Australia or um, I think it's Uruguay where they don't wear white face at all still. It's part of their... Um, way to kind of connect and still still be seen more as nuns because Catholics don't wear makeup. So um, it's their way to kind of say we're sticking more true to the nun and everybody kind of has their own, you know, colloquialism uh, thing. Um, Sister Mish also has what we call Mish face, um, which is essentially she'll have the habit and she'll kind of have her regular face, but then she might wear like a little bit of lipstick, a little bit of cheek, um, a little bit of eyeshadow or, or a sprinkle of glitter, but not like a full face of makeup. And so you know, sometimes when we're busy, we don't have enough time, but like, I'm going to do mish face tonight. I'm going to go out and 
bare, barely there makeup. And that's okay too. So the interpretations, once you're a fully professed member, the interpretations and how you represent manifest are really up to you. All right. So what was the largest amount of fundraising the Grand Canyon Sisters of Perpetual Indulgence has done since its inception? Oh, you went. Oh, so, oh, I'm not, we're not just not going to round up. Oh no. You're going to make me say all of these All these numbers. Oh my gosh. I've ever, ever had a cocktail. Jeez. Yeah, I know. <laughs> <laughs> all right. So a $9,027 and 92 cents, or is it B $18,024 and 15 cents? C, $21,389.18, or D, $26,363.81. And the answer is exactly. Oh my gosh. Yeah, so so we have not been as... as um, I would say blessed as like San Francisco sisters where of course their area has a ton of money. They have a lot of people contributing all the time. They make a ton of money during Easter, um, during their very famous events, Folsom street fair, Halloween, um, all the events that they've held in the past. But um, in 2019, we actually fundraised $26,363 and 81 cents. So you can see that they, we, we had kind of rounded that number before we got the final answer. Um, and that's what went out on Facebook. So there you are. Um, and uh, this is, our order as, as it is now, for the most part, these are most of our active sisters and that's also on our Facebook. Um, but we just want to kind of wrap up and say, you know, we, we raise all this money and people are always like, where does it go? What, you know, what do you do with that money? Um, fundraising is one of the ways we give back. We also do community service. We also have boots to the ground um, conversations with homeless people or people that are out there, you know, um, trying to sell their art or at uh, first Friday or those kinds of things. Um, and we also manifest to just kind of bring joy we go to Comic-Con or, or I guess Fan Fusion now, or we go to Pride and we just kind of partake to, to spread joy, to be like, we're here. If you need us, we're here. Please, you know, just acknowledge the presence that we have and we'll acknowledge your presence and support you in what we can. Um, and so all of this money that we fundraise goes back into the community. Uh, we very rarely have any kind of leftover money at the end. And it just, if it does roll over, it's rolling over so that we can actually start the next year off right. So we donate and work with organizations such as Joshua Tree, um, One in Ten, Aunt Rita's, um, the AIDS Walk specifically as a part of Aunt Rita's is something we've done uh, as one of our nuns of the above uh, passed away. We do that in honor of her sister with Syria. Um, Native P flag, uh, let's see, Ignite and the Southwest Center, and including Ripple now, um, Baca, so Bikers Against Child Abuse, uh, Rebel and Divine, the Children's, the Phoenix Children's Hospital, um, Arizona Power Exchange. There are so many different kinds of organizations that we work with. It's not just limited to HIV and AIDS research, although of course that's kind of where our, our foundation is still. But we also work with children or children's orgs, uh, women's orgs. Um, domestic violence, homelessness, like we work with all these different kinds of orgs it, throughout the Valley and the money just goes back out to them to support their operations as well. And so as a nonprofit, that's what we do. Uh, and we look forward to doing it every year. Of course, COVID has kind of changed our numbers <laughs> slightly. And so what we've been focusing on lately is just kind of bringing joy to the community and showing up where we can, um, while also trying to be safe because of course COVID numbers are back up. We're almost at like 30% right now of, of, uh, or it's 30 per or whatever, whatever, 100,000 or something like that are um, infected and, and that's slowly climbing again. So um, we're just trying to be safe and bring joy and get rid of guilt as we always do and have a good time and maybe kind of stretch out to other places, not just local bars or LGBT institutions. But if you have somewhere you want us to be, please reach out to us and let us know so we can join you. And we're more than happy to show up for our community. All right. So I always like to end trivia with asking people, how did they do? And well, people decide whether they want to put in their scores or not. So Sister Jareth, how can people learn what events are coming up for the sisters? Yeah. So the, the most active uh, social media that we have right now is definitely Facebook. We try to post all of our events to Facebook. And we also, again, trying to be safe or give opportunities for people that are across the Arizona state and not just in the Valley. We do some online events as well. So on June 4th, we're doing a pride talking circles, what we're calling it. Um, and it's basically a way for people to talk about pride. 
um, bring up pride stories, kind of share stories, almost like we did here. And that's with Sister Mimosa. And that will be on Facebook Live from 12 to 1 p.m. Um, we also have, uh, we're doing, it's not an official event, but we're going to PFLAG in Yuma, a few of us, um, for an event that they're doing there to help them fundraise. Uh, so just, again, we're sometimes we're, we're kind of stuck in this bubble of the valley. This is one of the ways that we're kind of exiting that bubble uh, to go to Yuma and support them. We, we haven't been there in a long time. And that is going to be called Unleash Your Kink. And that will be happening um, the evening of the 11th. And um, I think that'll be a good time. It'll be a very interesting adult event for PFLAG, um, which is kind of fun. Um, and then Bisbee Pride. And again, trying to get out of the bubble. We try to do Bisbee Pride every year that it has been around. Of course, COVID is kind of changed how we how we do that but this year it's the 17th through the 19th of june so we'll be there um danae pride also is the whole week of june 20th through the 25th the sisters uh that will be attending will probably be there on the weekend so you can catch us there um absolution is uh one of our annual events that we're bringing back now that we kind of have um some more safety some vaccinations out there and absolution is it's, it's very uh, non-themed in that we're going to absolve you of your sins. Uh, we're thinking of the title, Go Forth and Sin Some More. Um, and it will, again, kind of involve um, Apex and um, other groups like the, the Phoenix Boys of Leather. Uh, so it's a very much like a kink BDSM event. But you could come and, you know, pay for your friends to be absolved of their sins, kind of an embarrassing way. But it's a very adult and fun uh, event. And we're looking to fundraise, but we're also just looking to connect with people. And that will be from uh, 10 p.m. to 12 a.m. at Anvil in, on October 15th. And then we are also planning to help support Camp Outdoors with their annual camping uh, retreat. Unfortunately, that's not an open to the public event, but we hope to uh, work with them to just, again, kind of connect with youth. Um, coming back to youth every year is always helpful. And to talk to them about the history that they don't know and, and uh you know, all of the history that each of us holds, both, um, you know, kind of verbally, mentally, orally, and also kind of the, the books that we have and the magazines. And that's something that I know you and I talked about uh, before we started, that there's a lot of a lot of history that the sisters have from Grand Canyon Sisters of Perpetual Indulgence, but a lot of it is physical. We're trying to digitize that a little bit. So we have more pictures, more archives that people would come and check out. Um, so that's kind of what's going on for the next couple of months. And again, if you want to reach out to us, you could check out our Facebook or um, it's facebook.com slash AZ sisters, I believe, or you could go to AZ sisters.org and that's our website. And you can reach out to us there as well. You can find me on Facebook if you want. Indeed. They can find you on Facebook. <laughs> so, so Jared, thank you so much for coming on and telling us a little bit about the history of the grand Sis grand Canyon sisters, as well as kind of how they fit into the scheme of just LGBTQ history. As we start, I mean, as we're kind of kicking off June a little on the early side, but, you know, it's never too early to have some education going on. Right. Definitely pride. So thank you so much and have a great rest of your night. Thank you. You too. All right. So, I, wow. Thank you, Sister Jareth, for coming on and sharing that. So since we've kind of, we're trying to things some things around a little bit. So from the vault. So Sister Jareth had mentioned um, Harry Hay, who was one of the founders of the Matching Society, as well as the Radical Fairies. Well, I recently made a trip to Southern Arizona and was able to drive by the ashram where they held that first organized meeting. Um, sadly, it, the gate was locked, so I couldn't get in. Um, I had heard a rumor that it was for sale, but I have found out since it has sold. So not quite sure what's going on with the property, but I was hoping to actually maybe walk through and get a tour. But it doesn't look like that will happen. Um, and then as we go on to some Arizona music... So, you know, one year ago today was when I found out about the passing of Rusty Warren. She had passed away one year ago. She was a comedian slash piano player um, here in the Valley. Um, here really creating kind of her. Um, she was a very pro-feminist comedian and song and songwriter. And so her big hit was called Knockers Up. And so she has passed away. And so she has, she is now billed as the birth mother of the sex revolution for 
the music she was creating right here in Phoenix. And so since her passing, kind of my little nod to her is talking about how we really do need a bust of Rusty Warren somewhere here in the city to connotate the history of Knockers Up and Rusty Warren. So now you'll see why if I always say, you know, you should share because we always get to have so much fun here talking about history. You never know quite where it's going to go. And that's kind of the fun. Um, next week, we have my friend Todd Bailey, who is kind of changing the world with dance. He is a dancer and has been working with a lot of youth to do dance. And so that's going to be a really fun episode as he talks about a wide variety of things. And so that's going to be a super fun episode with lots of great stories. So that is next Thursday at seven o'clock, same bat time, same bat channel. Now, I always love to give a shout out to Chris and Cole, who created that amazing video at the intro, as well as PJ, my cocktail advisor. And as the outro, I am going to show the Ignite that we did. A, um, gosh, I think that was only a month ago. They turned this around really quickly. And so this is a little bit on LGBTQ history right here in Arizona. So thank you all so much and have a great rest of your night. Hello and good evening. Guess what I'm going to talk to you about? If you guess history, you're right. A little over 22 years ago, my partner and I decided to leave New York City. Leaving a library, a beautiful Carnegie building I was library manager of, and moved to Phoenix, the Wild West. As soon as we got here, all I heard was there's no history. But I got here and everywhere I went, I saw people and places that had so many stories. But not everybody's story was evident. And so when I asked about LGBTQ history, all I heard was, we have nothing. It's all been knocked down. Case in point, the 307. All that reminds of that is a plaque in the sidewalk, some memories, but it was the catalyst that started the Arizona LGBT plus history project. On vacation in Provincetown, I found a stack of those muscle magazines from the 50s. I'm flipping through and my jaw drops because muscular mermen, half naked guys, all from Phoenix was the artist. George Quaintance, he was working here throughout most of the 50s doing his art. And then I met a woman, Rusty Warren. I was flipping through a bin of rap albums in a thrift shop, and I came across one of her 15 albums. Now her hit song was Knockers Up. <laughs> she was very much a feminist in her music, and so I was lucky to work with the Library of Congress to get that music to them so she can be called the birth mother of the sex revolution. Indeed. So my joke is we need a bust of Rusty somewhere in this city. So the term two-spirit, which is a relatively new term, but really references an ideal that was lost decades ago and really honoring those folks and indigenous communities that live in other genders. They've been celebrating that at the Two-Spirit Powwow at South Mountain Community College for the last few years. And then someone slipped me a name, Nikolai Duralin. He was a Russian aristocrat that decided it was time to move to the US, so he moved to Chicago. Now he got a good government job, got two wives, one divorce, and tuberculosis. So like so many people, he came here for not just our dry air, but our clean air. But you know, he didn't travel like everyone else. He had his own doctor. Why, in fact, in the boarding house he was in, he had his own private bathroom installed in his room. If you can imagine calling the Hilton and asking for something to be installed in the room, good luck. And so it didn't go so well for him. When he passed away, it was discovered that he was born a woman. That story went viral. 
And I was lucky enough to work with the local trans community because he had been buried in a dressing gown with no headstone. So I worked with amazing people like Erica and Monica. Now, Monica, you might not know Miss Helms, or actually Mrs. Helms, but you know her activism. If you've ever seen the trans flag, that was her creation. She did that right here in Phoenix, and that flag is now sitting in the, the Smithsonian Institute. She's also a veteran and still very much a trans activist. We were able to commemorate, celebrate, raise funds to get Nikolai a headstone. And that's just what we did. In fact, I was just at an event over the weekend. A woman stopped me in my tracks and showed me a photo of her and a group of her friends that had tracked down this headstone, laid flowers in front of it, and took a group photo. Then a woman from ASU said, hey, let's do a project. We showed it on PBS. It was up for an Emmy the next day. Guess what? We won the Emmy. 